I wanted to give you an update on where Ohio is. It sounds like people are at least somewhat familiar with it. Um, first SORNA compliant state. It's kind of a dubious distinction. Um, we've had some good news though, and I'll get into that here in just a minute too. Um, so we are past the deadline for SORNA compliance, as I'm sure you know. Uh, July 27th of this year was the last final deadline uh, for states, Indian tribes, and territories to come into compliance. Uh, Ohio was the first, uh, and we have largely backed away from compliance ever since then. So I want to um, update you on what's going on and then talk a little bit about what we're looking at nationally now. There we go. So just briefly to remind everybody where we are, um, as you know, the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act was signed into law by President Bush July 27, 2006, um, and jurisdictions were given five years to implement. And what they were given five years to implement, and this is just a little bit of, of language to remind you of, the Adam Walsh Act is broken down into several different titles, which is just different sections of the law. And Title I is SORNA, the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. And it's that Title I that states have five years to comply with. Um, it's a little bit of semantics. It's not necessarily terribly important, but I think it's kind of important to keep in mind because you have the Adam Walsh Act, which is very, very large. And it includes not just registration issues, but it talks a little bit about civil commitment um, and some other issues. And it's only Title I, it's only SORNA, that states had to comply with by July of this year. I think it's also somewhat important to keep the distinction in mind between SORNA and Adam Walsh, because when you talk about SORNA, you're not saying Adam Walsh over and over again. You're not bringing up this picture of a victim over and over again of a little boy. And so just for semantics purposes, I think it's important sometimes to talk about SORNA because it's a little less personal when you talk to people about it. The five-year deadline I mentioned, here are all the different territories that had to come into compliance. There are over 200, ter or over 200 jurisdictions. States and territories that didn't come into compliance risk losing 10% of grant, federal grant funding called the Burn Justice Grant. Indian tribes who don't come into compliance lose sovereignty over this issue to whatever state that that tribe resides in, even if that state isn't compliant. The, the, the tribe potentially loses their sovereignty on this issue to the non-compliant state. That's obviously a, a huge issue for tribes. So Ohio, this is my favorite quote. I've been using this, I've been presenting on this issue for probably four or five years now. And uh, if you can't be a good example, you have to serve as a horrible warning. And I think that's a pretty good summary of, of Ohio. And I think we're both, you know, I think in some ways we're the good example because uh, we didn't become compliant, and that was unfortunate, but we've also fought like crazy, and we've been successful. Uh, but I think we're also a pretty horrible warning, and I think that serves some purpose as well. So less than a year after the federal Adam Walsh Act went into effect, Ohio passed its Senate Bill 10, uh, and that is our... Um, we had a months-long lobbying strategy um, that my office took on along with several other Ohio organizations and individuals. And we were successful in backing the law down some. Um, the two main points where we were successful, one um, was retroactivity. Um, SORNA requires what we had termed super retroactivity. Um, it requires people to be brought onto the new SORNA scheme who, at the time the bill is passed, are either on the current state registry, in prison, on parole or probation, just kind of what they call on paper. But then there's also this provision in the administrative guidelines of SORNA that says, say somebody had a sex offense 40 years ago, long before we ever thought anything about these registries. They served their time, they did whatever, they've been living a fine life for all these years, and then they come back in for marijuana possession or something very, very minor, some non-sex offense, the SORNA administrative requirements say that those people need to go on the registry. Even if they've lived 30, 40 years with no sex offense and, and now have no other sex offense. In Ohio, we were successful in convincing our legislature not to do that, what we term super retroactivity. Um, it was still retroactively applied to about 26,000 people in Ohio. And those are the folks who were on paper at the time that Senate Bill 10 went into effect. Um, when, so it, it, it was signed into law June 30th, it went into full effect January 1 of 08. And in that six month period in between, our state attorney general 
sent reclassification letters to those 26,000 people. So you had been classified under the old law, you had whatever your registration duties were, and one day in the mail you get this letter that says, just kidding, those aren't your registration duties anymore, now you're on it for life, now you're on it for 25 years, whatever that was. More than 7,000 people in Ohio filed petitions objecting to their reclassification, and that was huge. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here. So what this did to our registry in Ohio was pretty much turn it upside down. We used to have essentially three um, classifications under our old Megan's Law, which was a risk-based classification. The top one, SOO, sexually oriented offender. That's the lowest um, category, not likely to reoffend. They had to register for 10 years. Habitual offenders were the middle with a 20-year registration. And predator were the, the high um, people who had been found after a judicial hearing to be likely to commit another sex offense, and they had to register for life. So as you can tell from that first chart, more than three quarters in our old registry were on the sexually oriented offender, the low end, the people not likely to reoffend. And we had, I think, about 18% in that predator classification. Now, I'm sure you guys are familiar with some of the science that's out there that talks about recidivism rates. That's not a bad, that's, that's a pretty good representation of what those, those studies show us. It's a little high, 18% is, is high. We're talking usually more about like eight to 12% recidivism. Um, but you know, overall, it's really not a bad look at what the chances are of somebody actually reoffending. Switch to reclassification under our Senate Bill 10 and it gets completely skewed. The green, the tier three, the lifetime people, the supposed threats, become more than half of our registry, three times the number of people who were the high end under our old registry. So you took what had been a risk-based registry that gave people maybe a decent idea of who out there posed some sort of future threat, and you threw them all essentially in the same pool in the, in the new registry, half of them in that high end, tier three, a third of them in that second tier, and just a small percent, 13% uh, as tier one. So it completely turned the registry on its head, and we would argue that it makes it a completely unuseful public safety tool. If there is any public safety value at all to these registries, which is debatable, this undoes it completely, right? Because how can you know? If you're looking at a registry with 26,000 people, and more than half of them supposedly are the greatest threat out there, it really tells you nothing. So then the issue becomes, is Ohio compliant? So 2009, we are, what, two and a half years um, after the federal law is signed. No state is compliant, and in January of 2009, Ohio gets a letter, it's a very lengthy letter, it's six, seven, eight pages, and it says, sorry, you're not in compliance, and here are all the ways, and they list a whole bunch of ways that we are not in compliance with the law. About eight months later, we get another letter and it says, hey, great job, you guys are compliant now. <laughs> in between those two dates, Ohio passed no legislation dealing with sex offender registration. We passed no administrative rules dealing with sex offender registration. The only thing that was noted in that, the September letter is one page, and it's not even a page, it's like a half a page. The only thing that they actually note in that letter is that we, that the Attorney General's office made some sort of internal change to their computer system dealing with, I think it was like how they put um, military convictions in the system. I don't know, it was completely minor, no legislation. Somehow apparently that was enough to, you know, switch. Um, but what actually changed between January 09 and September 09 is the administration in Washington. The first letter came from the SMART office as run by President Bush's appointee. The second letter came from the SMART office that is currently run by President Obama's appointee. That's what changed. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard, and I can't remember for sure if I talked about this last year or not, but the issue of strict compliance versus substantial compliance. Um, the federal Adam Walsh Act says that states have to substantially comply with the regulations in the federal bill. Um, and substantial is a, ha is a legal term of art. Um, they use it a lot in lawsuits about whether, you know, whether the court substantially followed the rule or not. And there are times when, the, when a court has to substantially follow a rule and times when they have to strictly follow a rule. Substantially means 
more than not. So you follow the rules somewhere between 51% and 99%, right? So you followed it more than you didn't, but you didn't necessarily have to 100% follow every single letter. That's where the federal Adam Walsh Act says that states have to come in, substantial, 51 to 99. Under the the Bush smart office, they were really going for strict compliance, which is 100% every I dotted, every T crossed. And under that, that measure of review, Ohio didn't meet the standards, and that's true. I mean, like I said, we didn't do the super retroactivity. I didn't go into the details on the juveniles, but we backed way down on the juveniles. Um, it's clear that between January and September, they backed down from that strict compliance standard, and they went more to a substantial compliance standard, which is what the federal law actually requires. So I'm skipping ahead through lots of years of litigation and all kinds of things um, to get you up to where we are now. Uh, last year, last June, uh, the state Supreme Court issued its decision in a case called State versus Bodike. Um, like I said, there were more than 7,000 petitions filed by folks who had been reclassified by letter. Uh, my office, the county public defender offices, the ACLU, Ohio Justice and Policy Center, lots of groups in Ohio. It was a, it was a really incredible effort, I think. Um, and certainly a lot of the credit goes to all the folks out there who, who filled out their own forms without a lawyer uh, and, and turned them into their local, local courts. Um, those cases, 7,000 plus, made their way up through the Ohio court system. And that was really important. Um, 7,000 cases is a lot. You know, going through 88 different county courts, it really bogs things down. Um, because even if, even if the, the person who files a petition doesn't have a lawyer, and many of them did, the prosecutor has to get involved, the court clerk has to take that filing, the judge has to have a hearing on it. You know, there might be, who knows what all is involved. And so that really gets the courts invested in this issue, whether they want it or not. And I think that's really important. It also led to a fair amount of media attention in Ohio. Um, local courts didn't like this. They didn't like that they were suddenly having to hear 7,000 plus cases that they didn't realize were coming. Um, and the local papers understood that. And they didn't really understand why Columbus had, had passed this ridiculous law that, that bogged down their courts like that. Those cases make their way up. Um, in November of 09, we had what we called Senate Bill 10 Day at the Ohio Supreme Court. We had four cases argued in one day, all dealing with a retroactive application of Senate Bill 10, um, two adult cases and two juvenile. Bodike was the first decision to come out in June of last year. And what the court decided was that when the state attorney general, who was a member of the executive branch of government, reclassified those 26,000 people who had originally been classified by the judiciary, that that was a violation of the separation of powers doctrine. And I'm sure you guys, I mean, that's, you know, kind of basic government 101, judicial, executive, um, legislative branch. They each have their own responsibilities. They can't impinge on what the other ones are doing. And so the, the, the Ohio Supreme Court said, you, Attorney General, had no authority to undo those 26,000 judicial classifications. Um, so they said that they hold the reclassifications by the AG invalid and reinstate the prior judicial classifications of sex offenders. So, oh, I guess I went out of order there for a second. Um, the decision itself was good, obviously. This was huge. It undid significantly the, the retroactive application of Senate Bill 10. But there were other things in the Bodike decision that gave us a lot of hope. Um, they didn't just say, you know, here's an analysis of separation of powers and here's how you violated it. They had a lot of language in there that made us think that the court didn't really like Senate Bill 10 a whole lot. Um, the first one, we're persuaded that the Adam Walsh Act is substantially different from Megan's law. This was important because when we first started challenging Senate Bill 10, Courts across the state, um, prosecutors across the state, and then even if you're looking at some of the federal case law out there, um, courts are saying, you know what, we've decided this already. When Megan's Law came in in the 90s, we looked at this, the state Supreme Courts looked at this, the, the U.S. Supreme Court looked at this, and everybody said it was fine. So we don't really know why we're going over this issue again. It's really important, it was important to us, that the Ohio Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. Senate Bill 10, very different from Megan's law. And so this, we need to take a fresh look at this. We can't just look back at our old case law and said, we said it was fine then, it must still be fine now. So that was significant. 
They also clearly didn't like the fact that we had switched from a risk-based system to this offense-based system. Because in our old system, everybody had a separate hearing. After they were convicted, there was a separate hearing. Um, experts on both sides, people were evaluated for risk assessments. They didn't, the, the Supreme Court didn't like the fact that the trial court was removed from this process now and had no discretion and had no ability to do fact-finding about whether somebody poses a high risk to reoffend or not. And finally, we recognize that one sexually oriented conviction without more may not predict future behavior. That's very important for the highest court in the state of Ohio to recognize. They didn't have to say that, right? They're doing an analysis of law, but they were taking a look at some of the scientific information that we were able to offer in amicus briefs um, from researchers, from folks who know these issues, and it's clear that the court read that and that that influenced their opinion. <coughs> So what happened after the Bodite decision came out last year was about 20,000 or so of the 26,000 people who had been reclassified gradually, very gradually, um, were reinstated to their old Megan's Law classifications. It wasn't everybody. Um, there were about 6,000 or so who were, were still under their Senate Bill 10 classifications. And that's because the language in the Bodite decision was purely based on the separation of powers issue and so all the court said, if you remember from a couple slides ago, was, was we reinstate the prior judicial classifications. There were some people in Ohio who did not have judicial classifications. Say somebody had an offense from another state and then moved into Ohio, they didn't go through the whole judicial process. What they did was they showed up at the county sheriff's office and said, here I am, I moved here, here's my offense, and the county sheriff just put them in a category. More often than not, they put them in the lowest category because that's just what they did. Um, so there were about 6,000 or so folks who were from out of state or the timing of their offense with the Megan's Law and, and whatever made it to where they didn't have a prior judicial um, uh, classification. Um, so there were still questions about those folks, and we were kind of having battles case by case on those. Um, the other big thing that's been happening and that we're still trying to clean up is people who got convicted for failure to register under the new law, so say that you had been a sexually oriented offender under the, our old law. You had to register once a year for 10 years. Then you move to tier three, you have to register four times a year every year. And if you miss one of those four, you can get a failure to register conviction, even though prior you only had to register once a year. So we had folks serving years in prison for failure to register, but then Bodite comes out and it turns out that they were failing to register for an unconstitutional classification. Does that make sense? So courts are saying, no, you can't have those failure to register convictions. So we're, and, and this is another big process because there are dozens and possibly hundreds of people in Ohio who have these convictions over these years. We're trying to identify them, bring them back into court and get them, get those um, convictions taken care of. And that's still going on. The next big case, um, and I'm hoping that people have heard about this, just came out a little over a month ago. I guess a month ago today, huh? Uh, State versus Williams. Um, so the court in Bodike, we had raised a whole host of different constitutional issues. And usually what courts do is they decide the minimum of what they have to in order to settle the case in front of them. And that's what they did in Bodike. They came to the decision on um, separation of powers. That took care of the issue for Mr. Bodike, and so they didn't go on to, to look at all the other issues that we had raised. Well, Williams came up, and Mr. Williams did not have a separation of powers issue in his case. So he did have just a, a pure retroactivity claim. Um, and the first sentence there sums up this 30-page opinion. Following the enactment of Senate Bill 10, all doubt has been removed. Revised Code Chapter 2950 is punitive. That's huge. That's huge, right? Because courts up until now had said, this isn't punishment, right? It's like in, in our Megan's Law case from years ago in Ohio, they said sex offender registration is like having to go to the DMV every four years and renew your driver's license, right? It's administrative. It's not punishment. So for them to finally say, yeah, you know what, this crossed the line, this is punishment. It's not administrative. It's, it's, it's a continuation of punishment, and the Ohio Constitution does not allow that. It does not allow you to punish somebody after the fact, retroactively. Re retroactively. Um, 
Now, they, they decided it on the state constitution. The Ohio constitution has a retroactivity clause. You might, you probably have heard the phrase ex post facto. That is just the fancy schmancy Latin way of saying retroactivity. It's, it's the language that's included in the U.S. Constitution. The Ohio court specifically um, founded on the Ohio retroactivity clause, and that's important. I'll get into that in just a little bit. So what we have now, essentially in Ohio, is two registries happening, right? We have the old registry that everybody in Bodike went back to and that now we're gradually getting the Williams folks back onto. After Williams, we have about six or so thousand people who still need to be moved back to the old registry. Um, once again, that's happening very, very slowly. The Attorney General's office is in no particular hurry. Um, and the good news is lots of folks are then moving off the registry. Folks who had just a 10-year registration requirement under the old law, a lot of them are starting to age out of the system now, which is nice. Um, so we have the two registries, essentially. We have the pre-Senate Bill 10 registry, which is risk-based, is that first pie chart I showed you. And that's everybody who was convicted of an offense that happened before Senate Bill 10 occurred. Then we have the kind of parallel tracked SORNA compliant registry, which is offense-based, no risk assessment whatsoever. Um, and that's for everybody convicted of an offense after Senate Bill 10 went into effect. And that's what will continue, that's the registry that will continue to grow. Um, as we move forward. Now, we should still be in compliance, I think. Um, there is language in the federal Adam Walsh Act that says that the U.S. Attorney General can find a state to be in compliance if, even if they have not uh, implemented part of the SORNA, if they haven't implemented that part because the state's highest court has said that that violates the state constitution. And that's what's happened here. Ohio's highest court, which is our Supreme Court, has looked at the retroactive requirements of SORNA and said that violates the Ohio constitution. So even though Ohio essentially at this point has not implemented SORNA retroactively, I believe we should still be in compliance with the federal Adam Walsh Act. We haven't heard any differently. Uh, so far as I know, there's been no discussion between our state and the SMART office, so I believe we should still be in compliance. Um, that's important, I think, for other states to look at. Um, it, it shows the importance of these concerted litigation efforts, right? If you lose in your lobbying efforts, which we not lose, I guess, but, but it, was, it was passed, even though we tried to, to stop it, the litigation can still really back down the requirements of the act and hopefully not put the state in a situation where they're found to be no longer in compliance with the federal law. That's kind of the best of both worlds. If, if they're gonna go for compliance, let them go for compliance, but let's back down the requirements as much as we can. Now, since the Williams decision came out last month, the state attorney general um, filed a petition asking the Supreme Court to reconsider its decision and to decide it on the federal ex post facto grounds. Obviously what they're trying to do is to set it up so that they can appeal it to the federal court system. We don't want that, right? Because right now when it's based, when it's an Ohio Supreme Court ruling based on the Ohio Constitution, that's as high as it goes. There's no federal court that looks at that decision because it's the Ohio Constitution. The Ohio Attorney General obviously is hoping to get another bite at the apple and get into federal courts. We don't think there's really much of a chance of that. I, we think that the Ohio Supreme Court's gonna say, no, we did exactly what we meant to do, and, and this is where this stops. Um, just to let you know, there's still several cases pending in the Ohio Supreme Court. Here's um, a list of just a few of them. The first four are all juvenile cases. The first two, Smith and Adrian R., were argued in November 2009. So we're going on two years that the court's been sitting on those cases, and we don't really know why. Um, the first three all deal, again, with the retroactive application to kids. Um, now that the court has said that registration under Senate Bill 10 is punitive, we're hopeful, we don't know if this will happen or not, but kind of our next area of attack for juveniles is juveniles can't receive adult punishment. The court has said this is punishment, so we're hoping that instead of just kind of backing down the juvenile to where we have the adults now, where there's no retroactive application, our new argument is it shouldn't apply to kids at all because the court has said this is punishment Kids don't get punished. That's why we have a separate juvenile court system. We'll see where those shake out. We, we don't know. It's been almost two years, so who knows when they're going to come out with those. Um, NRACP is um, another juvenile challenge. 
It is a challenge, though, to the prospective application. So we don't have the retroactivity issues. It's a prospective application of the bill, but it's to the kids in Ohio. There's a small group of kids in Ohio who go on the internet registry. CP is one of those kids. This is a constitutional challenge to his being included on the internet registry. And then State versus Lloyd, it's, it's kind of funny, I think. Um, now, the whole purpose supposedly behind the federal Adam Walsh Act is so that all the states are on the same system, right? And you move from state to state and you know what all the tiers are and there's no confusion. Well, now that we've managed to kind of bifurcate Ohio's systems again, there's a lot of confusion. So Lloyd comes from, I think, Texas. He had whatever his conviction was called in Texas. It's a crime that we don't define the same way in Ohio. So the question is, where does he end up on the registry? So we're having to litigate this issue all over again now and say, do we look at you know, the name of the crime and try to mash it with the name of a crime in Ohio? Do we look at the elements of his offense and fit it into a crime? So it's, it's kind of funny because we were, trying, we were researching for this case and we were trying to figure out how other states do this when they deal with folks from out of state. And I was trying to find somebody who had already done the research, right? If we don't have to do the research, all the better. And the only place that I could find that had done the research to figure out how all 50 states deal with, with offenders from other states was a smart office. So I decided not to call them and ask them for their research because we had just gotten them overturned in Williams. But that's, that's kind of fun. Um, so where are we now? Let me check my time here. Nationally, where we are, I think was summed up very, very nicely in an article that came out the day after the deadline on CNN.com. I'm assuming that a lot of folks here probably saw that. Um, I know that several folks here um, met with and talked with a reporter. I think this is a very good summary of where we are. So five years after a federal law goes into effect that essentially says, hey, states, you get to pick on sex offenders and we're going to give you federal money for it. 14 states managed to do it. I think that's saying something, right? I mean, how often do the state, the states never turn down federal money, never. And how often do politicians pass on the chance to pick on any offenders, right? Certainly sex offenders. But to only have 14 states come into compliance in five years is significant. In Ohio, a few days later, there was an article that I think equally nicely summed up the situation in Ohio. Ohio sex offender registry a mess. Four years after Ohio hurried to comply with federal law, the state could be forgiven for having buyer's remorse. And I think that's a pretty good summary of where we are. We risked losing 10% of our burn JAG grant funding. Maybe like, I think it was a million four, I think is what we were up to. So had we not implemented any of this, Ohio would have been shortened by a little over a million dollars in federal funds. Now, it's really hard to figure out how much implementing Senate Bill 10 has cost Ohio. Ohio has 88 different counties. All the court systems are separate, public defender systems, prosecutors, everything. But let's think about what happened. 26,000 people were reclassified and sent letters about their reclassification. More than 7,000 people filed petitions. Every one of those 7,000 petitions went into a court like I said earlier, was handled by a court clerk, a prosecutor, a judge, maybe a magistrate, maybe a probation officer, maybe a public defender, 7,000. More than 150 of those worked their way up to the Ohio Court of Appeals level. Once again, you've got three appeals court judges hearing every one of those cases. You've got the county prosecutor, you've got a public defender or possibly a, a, a privately retained attorney. You've got whatever clerks and other staff are handling 150 plus appellate cases. And then you've got dozens of them that then made their way up to the state Supreme Court. Do you think that costs more or less than $1.4 million? I think we're easily over $10 million, very easily over $10 million. And essentially where we are is where we started, right? I mean, they could have implemented Senate Bill 10 just prospectively, and we would have had the same kind of two-track two registry that we have now, and we would have had none of this litigation. Here's my favorite quote. It was a colossal boondoggle. This is one of my coworkers, and um, he's not 98 years old, even though he uses the word boondoggle, apparently. Um, and I think we've been teasing him quite a lot about that, but I think that's actually a pretty good summary. We've spent four and a half years in Ohio spending probably over $10 million to get us right back where we started. Um, and I guess we should probably go back to that quote I had at the beginning about um, being a good example or a, a horrible warning. <laughs> <laughs> 
So here we are, we are past the five-year deadline, and there are a grand total of 24 jurisdictions in the country that are in compliance. That's 24 out of 254, right? We've got 14 states out of 50, obviously, nine tribes out of 198, I think it is, and one territory. So five years they've had to implement this, and they have fewer than 10% of the jurisdictions on board. And I took a quick look at the 2010 census data just to get a sense of the, the states that we were looking at, because I knew we were missing the big ones, right? California, New York, and Texas have all said, we're not really interested, we're probably not gonna implement. You've got a couple big states up there, Florida, Ohio, Michigan are kinda high in the population range. So I just did a quick you know, rundown of the population. SORNA compliant states include less than a quarter of the population of the country right now, after five years of effort doing this. I think it's also pretty clear, um, like I mentioned before, that the standards that the smart office is using to determine what jurisdictions are in compliance are constantly lowering. Now, in some ways, that's a good thing, right? Because they're not requiring the strict compliance. They're not requiring that you do absolutely everything. So in that respect, it's kind of a good thing. Um, in, in another respect, it's letting them say that states and other jurisdictions are coming into compliance when really they aren't. So in some ways, I think it's letting them claim victory where maybe there isn't. Um, Maryland, for example, and I, on, on the day, on July 27th, the final day, the Smart Office put out a press release announcing another, I think, 14 or so jurisdictions. So it was a total last minute push to get a bunch more jurisdictions out there. One of those jurisdictions is Maryland. Um, and Maryland, and, and I haven't had a chance to look at the, the whole law itself, um, but I got an email from somebody who does some work in Maryland, and she said, the juvenile provisions, nowhere near what's required. There's no public registry, which no longer is required for juveniles, but the very most amount of time that a kid in Maryland will ever spend on the non-public registry is five years. They automatically come off when they're 21, and they can petition to come off before then. Now, that's wonderful, right? I mean, if you don't want kids on the registry, great, and more power to Maryland. Clearly, the smart office is letting a lot of things slide. Nevada is another state that was deemed into compliance. Nevada passed their compliance legislation years ago when Ohio did. They immediately filed a federal lawsuit, and a federal judge suspended that law from going into effect. Their SORNA compliance legislation has never gone into effect, and yet they've been deemed to be compliant. So I have yet to make any sense of that. Um, now that case, it's kind of like some of the Ohio Supreme Court cases, that case is just sitting out there. So the, the federal district court judge in, in Nevada said, this is unconstitutional, the state may not implement it. That case was appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. It's been sitting there for three years, maybe four years, I forget how long. Um, I actually just saw a couple weeks ago the attorney in that case, and she said they haven't even had oral argument yet. They've submitted their briefs, and the court hasn't even asked them to come in and argue. So. The court apparently is, is in no particular hurry. So what's next? First of all, I think we can probably expect there to be some more jurisdictions to be found to be in compliance. We're at 24 now. Uh, when the smart office handed out their, um, or put out their press release announcing the last jurisdictions a couple weeks ago, they said, Look, we got a flood of applications right at the last minute. We're still going to be going through those. So in the weeks and months to come, there might be more jurisdictions coming online. I mean, even if they double it, we're talking 50 jurisdictions. We're, that's still a pretty, I think, low compliance um, rate. So that might still be happening. So there's, there's a little bit of change afoot there. Congressional action. Um, it's a possibility. It's honestly something that I expected to happen before the July deadline. Um, I'm part of a national coalition called the Adam Walsh Act Working Group. Um, we've been working on this for a few years. It's kind of a cross-discipline area. It's got, a kind, it's got um, the National Conference of State Legislatures is in it. Um, there's some treatment groups. There's some you know, ACLU public defender types like me. Um, and we've been trying to do a little bit of lobbying on the federal level. And the folks in that group who are based in D.C., who, who understand the D.C. workings much better than I do, really thought that what we were, what we were doing was, was what they called playing, playing a game of brinkmanship, right? Congress didn't really want to make any changes to the law unless they absolutely had to. 
And so what, what the DC folks thought was happening was we were gonna go up until maybe the spring, like April or May, a couple months out from the July deadline. And when Congress saw that we were still gonna only be talking about a dozen or so jurisdictions, Congress would say, all right, fine, we're gonna extend the deadline or we're gonna do something to make this more feasible and more possible. That didn't happen, um, and that surprised a lot of us. Because right now where we are is it's done, right? July 27th of this year was the deadline. And once the smart office goes through that last batch of applications, that should be it. And when they finish reviewing those, every state that has not been found to be in compliance should start losing grant funding. And every tribe that's not found to be in compliance should start losing sovereignty. That's huge. Um, when that happens, if or when that happens, you, I think you can probably count on a pretty big backlash. States are not going to be happy about federal money disappearing. Indian tribes, I mean, losing sovereignty is, is huge. Um, so I think you can probably expect some lawsuits to be, to, to be generated by that. Um, it's still possible. They could still go in now um, and make a change to the deadline or make other changes. Sensenbrenner is a Republican uh, congressman from Wisconsin. He was a huge, huge proponent of the bill in 06. Um, he was then, you know, then the Democrats were in charge of the House for a while, so he was a member of the more minority. They're back in charge. He's the chairman, again, of the crime subcommittee. Um, so that's not the best political uh, environment for us. He's a huge proponent. He wants the bill um, implemented across the country, and he's now in charge of the crime subcommittee. So for what that's worth, we've, we've got that to deal with, too. So even though this is kind of an unsure time, we don't really know, I think, you know, before July 27th, I think we had a pretty clear idea of what our goals were, right? We knew that states needed to implement. We knew that we, I'm assuming, generally didn't want that to happen. Um, now we're in this kind of transition period. We don't really know what's going to happen next. We don't know if Congress is going to do something, if the smart office is going to do something, if states are going to start doing something. That doesn't mean, I don't think, that we can't still do the exact same kind of advocacy that we've been doing up until now, right? The four words that I wrote down, educate, activate, collaborate, and advocate. I think those four things can happen anytime. Even when we're a little uncertain of what's happening in Washington or a little uncertain of what's happening in our individual states, all of these things can still be done by the people in this room and by your allies. I wanted to introduce you to something, and maybe you've seen this before, called the public policy triangle. Um, this is something that I, I worked with a group of folks um, last year. We put together a, like an all-day seminar on, on advocating. And this was how one of my co-presenters presented it, and I thought it was a really good way of looking at things. And what they have are the three points of the triangle, the public, the media, and the government. And those three points of the triangle inform and create public policy. And each of those three points, the public, the media, and the government, they inform each other, they influence each other, they try to react to what the other wants, or at least what they think the other one wants, and so I think it's a good way when you're trying to talk about informing public policy or making public policy changes to think about it in these three respects, right? It's not just going to government and lobbying. You've also got to think about the media because the media informs the government, right? I mean, especially on this issue, maybe more than anything else. And you've also got to think a lot about the public perception because government is always going to be responsive to its constituents. And that's the public, what, what the public perceives the issues to be um, or what they perceive the solutions to these su supposed problems to be. Now, of the four words that I gave you before, I think the first one, educate, is probably the most important right now, and especially on this issue. And I found this quote, and I think it's, it, really, it really encapsulizes what we're dealing with on this issue. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And I think more than ignorance when we're talking about sex offender policy, it's the illusion of knowledge that, that, that hurts us, right? It's not that people are out there saying, I don't know anything about sex offenders. It's that people are out there saying they always reoffend, they're always dangerous, there's no way to keep the community safe from them, right? They think they know the facts and they're wrong. So it's not just a matter of starting with a fresh slate and trying to educate somebody. You've got to uneducate them of all the things that they think they think that are wrong and then start new. And that's huge. And I think that that's the kind of important work that groups like this can be doing all the time. 
regardless of where we are with SORNA, regardless of where we are with the Adam Walsh Act, we can focus on educating. And that can happen on, I mean, is there any point on that public policy triangle that doesn't need more education? I don't think so, right? Public needs more education, media, government. So that's something that can always be done. The good news is the public wants its legislators to make decisions based on facts. Uh, CSOM, the Center for Sex Offender Management, did a poll last year and they asked people, what single factor do you think lawmakers should rely on when making sex offender policies? And what single factor do you think they do rely on? Right? Should rely on, do rely on. The good news is the number one thing that the public wants legislators to rely on when they're making sex offender management policy is research. They want it to be informed by research about what actually works. 55% of people want it to be based on research. Now, only about 18% of people actually think that's what happens. And I think that maybe is even a little bit generous. Um, so that's good, right? The public doesn't say, yeah, I want you to respond to the news media. That's what I want you to legislate based on. I don't want you to legislate based on specific crimes. I want you to look at research. So that's good, and I think that gives us a lot of power when we're trying to educate people on, on, any, on any part of that public policy triangle. So the next thing that I had on our list was to activate, right? You've got to educate, then you've got to activate. Well, who do you activate? How do you identify your allies? I think it's important to, the Adam Walsh Act is huge, right? It's, it's huge, it's overwhelming, you've really got to break it down to its parts. So when you think about it, it's not just sex offender classification and registration, it's treatment, it's criminal justice, it's probation, um, there's even things about residency restrictions in there, it's, it's a lot of different issues. So let's you know, break it down and make a list of all the issues that it involves. Um, then you can take all of those issues and you can identify what systems out there are affected by it. The treatment community, the criminal justice community, social workers, obviously families affected by the registry, victims groups. So you can identify all the different systems and then you can identify every player within those systems. Right, so we're, we're starting to create a pretty big list here of potential allies to work with on this issue. Because if you look at the criminal justice system, it's judges, prosecutors, cops, defenders, social workers, um, probation officers, right? So we've got dozens and dozens and dozens of, of different types of people that we're looking at here. You can also ask yourself what kind of problems are going to be caused by these and who would have to deal with that. So when you're talking about these systems that might be affected and potential allies that you can reach out to, start thinking about the problems that you know exist with these issues and start figuring out who's going to have to deal with those problems, who in the system is going to take this on. In Ohio, a big kind of unlikely ally that we, we identified was the sheriffs because it's the sheriffs in Ohio who um, registrants have to go to. And they used to see most of the people once a year, and all of a sudden they're getting flooded four times a year by all these people. And especially in the small counties in Ohio, we realized the sheriffs kind of knew the people coming in, and they would actually be quoted in the papers as saying, I, I know this guy. It's, you know, I don't need to see him four times a year because there's only 20,000 people in my county. I know where he lives. He doesn't have to come see me three more times a year. I don't have the deputies to have on the road because now they have to sit behind the desk and have, you know, Bill come in four times a year. You've got to consider who you're targeting, um, which point of the triangle. So I think that you've got, to, you've got to shape your policy or shape your strategy based on if you're going after the public, the government, the media, obviously. And then obviously likely and un unlikely allies. And like I talked about, there's, there's a lot of power in unlikely allies, um, sheriffs, victims groups, law enforcement. A good place to look for unlikely allies, at least for us in Ohio, is other states. Um, a lot of times prosecutors, law enforcement folks who are kind of the, the natural opponents on these issues aren't always brave enough to speak out. But there are other states that have um, implemented these policies where they've been disastrous, and those kind of unlikely allies are more likely to speak out there. Um, Iowa, I know, is a, is a big state where they kind of went overboard with their residency restrictions and their district attorneys and sheriffs, and I forget who all, 
very publicly now come out against residency restrictions. Um, so I think it's, it's a good place to look. Um, and then finally, collaborating. This is a huge issue, right? This is a huge obstacle. And it's not anything that any one person or one group can defeat alone or even tackle alone. It really has to be a collaborative effort. Um, collaborating means working toward a goal that you couldn't achieve without working together, right? They're kind of like lesser ways of, of working together, like networking, where you're all kind of working toward the same issue and you maybe communicate a little bit, but it's not really that much of a concerted effort. Um, collaborating means you all need each other, right? You couldn't, you couldn't come, you couldn't surmount this goal without each other. Now, collaborating is tough. There are benefits to it, um, but there are a lot of challenges too, because when you, when you bring together this big tent in this collaboration, you're gonna have, you know, crazy liberal public defenders and ACLU folks, um, but you're also gonna have maybe some law enforcement folks and maybe some treatment providers and maybe some states' rights people. And you're all gonna have the same ultimate goal, but there's gonna be a lot of friction in there. And you're gonna have to be willing to deal with that friction, to confront it, and to maybe back off a little bit on, on some of what you're asking for. And that's not easy, right? I mentioned that Adam Walsh Act working group that I'm a part of, and that's been a challenge at times. It's been wonderful because we've had some really prominent uh, national organizations as a part of it, but you know, when, when you're dealing with kind of like the state's rights people, they've got a little bit different um, agenda than the public defenders have. And you've got to be willing to work with that. But I think it's vital when you're dealing with, with an issue this big. Um, sorry about that. So when you are working um, with any one of those points on the public policy triangle, media, government, public, and again, what I'm trying to do is, is talk to you about, about what you can be doing now, even when we don't necessarily have a clear, um, a clear issue. We don't really know where SORNA is right now. There's still a lot of things that we can be doing. Number one is become a resource, especially I think when you're talking about government and media. You are the folks who know the effect that this law has on your lives and the lives of your loved ones. Quite possibly you know the effect that it has on the lives of the victims. If you, you know, I know that a lot of folks have the victim, have victims in your families as well. Become a resource for reporters, for legislators, for legislative staff. You can reach out to people without necessarily asking them to do anything, right? You can just go meet your legislator in their district, or you can meet their staff member if you happen to be in, um, in your capital city. Just introduce yourself, let them know who you are. I'm not asking you for anything, but I just want you to know who I am. Here's my contact information. If you have questions, I'd be happy to talk to you. I'd be happy to connect you. You know, I know lots of folks who do treatment and who do, um, who, you know, the sheriffs who, who deal with these issues. Become a resource for them. Because if you're a legislative staff member and you have a question about sex offender management policy, chances are you're gonna think, well, I should call the prosecutors, right? Or I should call the judges. Um, but if you just happen to meet with somebody and you remember that person, you think, well, maybe I'll call that person too. Maybe I'll see who they direct me to. Same thing with the media. The media is always looking for people to talk to. If you become a good resource for them, either to talk to on their, ish on their articles or just to direct them to other people who they can talk to, they will always call you. They will always ask you for your help. This is not just an issue of sex offender management. It's not just an issue of criminal justice policy. Right? This issue can be defined in many, many different ways. Public safety, best practices, fiscal impact, federalism, constitutional rights. Use those different ways to define the message in all those ways and tailor your message to whoever you're talking to. Right? You're gonna go talk to some legislators or some members of the public who are gonna wanna hear a lot about your personal story and maybe don't really understand all the constitutional complexities. Um, or don't really know what federalism is or why they should care about it. But then you're gonna go talk to the legislator next door and he's not gonna care a whit about your personal story. He's gonna care about how much it's gonna cost the state. He's gonna care about Washington telling the state what to do, right? I think it's okay to do that. I don't think you have to go in and tell, the, tell every person the exact same message. 
I think you can go talk to the libertarian about small government, and you can go talk to the bleeding heart liberal about your personal stories. You don't have to give them the same message. You have to give them the message that's going to work for them. And not just the message, but the messenger, right? There are plenty of times when public defender, lobbyist, not going to be listened to. And that's okay. And that's why you have these big tent collaborations, because when we're going to go talk to somebody that doesn't want to hear from the public defender, we can send in somebody from the state's rights organization instead. Same thing with, with, with family members and, and people on the registry. There are going to be a lot of people who want to hear from you, and there are going to be people who probably aren't that willing to listen to you. And that's okay, and that's part of the collaboration model. It's not always, you know, you guys know more than anybody what these laws do. But there are times when there are going to be people out there who don't want to listen to you. And that's not easy to, to recognize, and it's not easy to deal with. But when that's the value of, of getting all your allies on board. That's a value of collaborating. And that's where collaboration gets hard, because there are going to be times when you're going to have to step back and say, maybe this isn't the time for me. You go forward on this one, and I'll go talk to somebody else. But that's incredibly powerful, too. Define specific problems um, and offer concrete solutions. When we were lobbying on Senate Bill 10, we originally just went in there with all of the, here's all the really bad things about it. And we got a lot of nodding heads from the legislators, but they didn't know what to do, right? Because they're not specialists in this area. They deal with all kinds of state policies. And it wasn't until we actually went in there and handed them language that they could use instead that we started to get momentum. They needed more than just here are all the problems. They needed here is a solution. So I would definitely encourage you, certainly go out there and say, SORNA is not good, not good public policy, bad fiscal policy, whatever. Give them what works. Tell them what they should be doing instead. Where should they be spending their money? Where should they be putting their resources? And finally, I think you have to have a good mix of policy and personal appeals. If you get too much just into the policy and the numbers and the research, right, people's eyes glaze over. They don't really recognize the, the profound impact that this has on families across the country. Same thing with personal. If you only talk personal, then it, 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 it becomes more of like a, a personal crusade that people are on. And there's not the science and the numbers to back, it, to back it up. So make sure you have a good mix of those things. Make sure you talk to them about the research, about the dollars, about the recidivism, about what we know works. But then also tell them about your personal stories and the effect that it's had on your lives and the lives of your loved ones. Get a good mix into there, and you'll, you'll get a sense. Like when you're meeting with people, you, you know. You know when they're listening. You know when they're paying attention. And you know when they're, they're ready to move on to something else. And of course, never forget that you can always sue them. <laughs> right? And that's, that's obviously where we've been focused in Ohio. And we've had some success. We've had success in Ohio. We've had success in Nevada. Um, like I said, there's a lot of value in the state lawsuits because we implemented SORNA, but then the lawsuits have been chipping away at it, chipping away at it. But we're still in compliance. So I think that's a good model. Um, the litigation is also a big red flag to other states because they've been, they've been watching Ohio, trust me, and they've seen what a colossal boondoggle it is, and they see the millions of dollars that we've spent to end up right where we started. And I think it's also really important to remember, and this is what happened in Ohio, you don't necessarily have to be a lawyer to start some litigation. We had thousands of people in Ohio who just filled out a form and filed it in their courts because we didn't have enough resources in the public defender system to get out there to all those thousands of people. People filling out their own forms and filing it with their court clogs up the, clogs up the system and gets the court's attention just as much as, as it does when there's a lawyer's signature on there. Um, now, obviously, I think it's important to get involved with your local public defenders, with your ACLU, with whatever other organizations are out there that might be willing to, to coordinate a litigation effort. Um, but you don't necessarily have to wait for them either. And I think that's important, especially for a group like this that doesn't necessarily have a lot of attorneys available to it. And finally, I just found a nice quote from uh, Winston Churchill that I think is a, a good thing for us to keep in mind as we're giving here, as we're as we're talking here. Never, never, never give in. Never yield to force, and never yield to the apparent, apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. I think that's a lot of where I've been for the last four and a half years. This is this issue kind of came out of nowhere for me. I'd never really dealt much with sex offender uh, legislation or litigation. All of a sudden the Adam Walsh Act and SORNA shows up on our legislative agenda and I'm thrown in the mix of it. And there were people in my own office when we started lobbying on this who said, don't waste your time. You know, this is a freight train and you're trying to step in front of it and you're gonna get run over. 
go work on something else. Uh, and that's easy to do, I think, because it's overwhelming. It's huge. It's national. Um, it's not a popular issue. It's not an easy issue. But I think that we've made it pretty clear in Ohio and in some other states that it's not unstoppable. Um, and so I just wanted to leave you with that thought that, um, you know, I think you're probably going to feel kind of puny at times, um, but you're not. And there's a lot of power in just standing up and, and speaking against it, even if it doesn't necessarily feel like you're doing anything right at that time. So I am happy to answer any questions. Okay, guys, I'm going to be uh, asking questions from here. And you can just stay there, Amy, and answer them, because the microphones don't work there, and we want this recorded. So um, we have only 10 or 15 minutes for the questions, and I got something like 30 of them. So. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, obviously, the overwhelming majority will not have their question answered. But I have an important question for you before uh, we begin. What does boondoggle mean? <laughs> <laughs> what does boondoggle mean? I don't even know how to... Would, <laughs> nick and poop? Kind of. I would, the only word I can think of is one that I shouldn't say in front of an audience. It starts with cluster. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's just like an old-timey way of saying that it's all messed up. All right, all right. Let's not waste your time. <laughs> a, little, a little joke. Uh, first question for you, Amy. How is the Ohio decision likely to influence courts in other states? Um, it definitely could. Um, courts are taking a look at... State Supreme Courts are, without a doubt, taking a look at what other state Supreme Courts are doing on this issue and on other issues. Uh, and not only that, but I think that some federal courts are looking at what state courts are doing, right? Because it matters to federal courts and it matters to other state courts kind of where the national consensus is. Um, and they take a look at that. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have paid any attention. In the last few years, there have been some rulings from the U.S. Supreme Court dealing with... Um, saying that juveniles can't be subjected to the death penalty, and then a more recent one saying that juveniles um, can't get life without parole. And in both of those decisions, the U.S. Supreme Court took a look at what all the laws were in the country because they wanted to see kind of what the national sense on this issue was. And they also looked at courts in other countries because they wanted to see nat or internationally where we, where we stood. And that helps influence, especially when you're talking about something like cruel and unusual punishment. That's a standard that changes, right? What we think of as cruel and unusual now is very, very different than 100 years ago. It's an evolving standard. And the same thing, I think, here um, when we're dealing with constitutional issues on, on SORNA. Other state Supreme Courts, I do believe, will look at the Ohio decision, and, and that will influence them. I know, like I said, I, I talked to the Nevada litigator a couple weeks ago, and she said as soon as the Williams decision came out, she filed that decision with the Ninth Circuit. She wanted to make sure that the Ninth Circuit took a look at that Williams decision. Um, because that will help inform, you know, judges care what other judges think. Um, and a lot of judges like cover, right? They don't necessarily want to be the first ones out there making a, a decision that's unlike other decisions. And so when they can point and say, hey, look, the Ohio Supreme Court, which, by the way, is six Republicans and one Democrat, um, said that this is punishment and said that this is unconstitutional, I think that's important. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, from someone outside the state, and I'm sure many people will be interested, why did the Ohio Public Defender Office become so involved? What is different from other states? Um, public defender systems in different states are set up in about 50 different ways. Um, there's not one model of, of, of how things are run. Um, and in Ohio is kind of unusual. We are a very decentralized system. I work for the State Public Defender Office, but we don't oversee all the public defender offices in Ohio. Each of the counties runs their own system. Um, but we do have the state office, which I'm a part of. We mainly do appeals. The trials are handled by the county level, and then we appeal uh, once somebody gets sent to prison. What's somewhat unique about my office is that they have my position. My position, the only thing I do is, is lobbying our state legislator, le legislature and media. Um, and there are some other state public defender offices that have a position similar to mine. So that's one difference. Um, we got involved right away. As soon as Senate Bill 10 was introduced, uh, 
because that's my job, we started lobbying on it and we started doing those, um, making those, those, those legislative efforts. And so it was just kind of a natural progression once we moved our way through lobbying and the bill was signed into law for our office then to continue taking the lead on the issue. Um, not every public defender office out there is going to do that, obviously. Um, it's, an, it's a matter of resources. Um, it's a matter of priorities. If, if they focus more on the trial level stuff, it's hard to get kind of a coherent statewide strategy. Um, but the good news is we have all of our stuff online. Um, so if there are any public defenders or ACLU or, or private attorneys out there that you know uh, who want to file something, who want to challenge it, we have pro se petitions online. We have the petitions that we filed, federal, state, everything online. There's no copyright. There's no pride of authorship. Like we want people to, to get on there and copy and paste and use it. Um, as a matter of fact, the Nevada federal lawsuit was pretty much a copy and paste of a federal lawsuit that we had filed in Ohio that had been unsuccessful. They filed it in Nevada and they were successful. Um, so there, aren't, there, there are other states definitely where the public defender may not be as proactive as we've been, but we're happy to share, we're happy to, to collaborate with folks who are willing to work on this. That might kind of change the atmosphere a little bit. Um, kind of like I said before, judges look at what other judges do. The Supreme Court looks at kind of the, the temperature of the nation. Um, I think if we, if, if this case went to the U.S. Supreme Court tomorrow, I think we'd be in, in pretty bad shape. If it goes there in five years and maybe another three or four or five states have ruled like Ohio's ruled, I think we would have a, a, a better chance. A question with a, a different scope. Um, <laughs> Have you done research on how uh, states treat out-of-state offenders? Because a lot of people would be interested in, that, in knowing about that. Um, yeah, I didn't personally, but we had um, one of our law clerks do that research, like I mentioned, for the one um, State versus Lloyd case. Um, so if anybody wants that, um, shoot me an email, and I can get you what our law clerk pulled together. Okay. Um, are there any politicians in Ohio who still think SB 10 was a good idea? Or still is? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, the chairman of our state, of our um, Senate Criminal Justice Committee, is um, a Republican named Tim Grendel. Um, and he railed against the Ohio Supreme Court ruling. But ironically, his wife is um, a judge in the Ninth District Court of Appeals. And she was the first appellate court judge in the state to find it unconstitutional. So <laughs> we... We were all wishing that we could be invited to dinner that night at their house, but, but yeah, there are plenty, there, there are plenty of, of legislators, I think, who grumble and don't like it, but my sense is that they're not really willing to take it on again either. When we've talked to people, they've said, we're done, we're not going to deal with this right now. How can uh, sex offender advocates get legal organizations to work with us to lobby against future sex offender laws? Many people find it difficult to get uh, legal organizations involved. Um, it is, and I think a lot of it is just a matter of resources and priorities. Um, obviously, you want to start with the most likely folks who are going to work on these issues, which would be public defenders, ACLU, um, but that varies a lot state by state. I mean, we were fortunate to have both my office and the state ACLU very engaged in this issue. Um, I know that the Michigan ACLU is very involved um, in some other states, and then there are some states where and I don't know, I, I don't know the particulars of, of those organizations um, where they just, they're not interested and they're not involved. Um, as far as how to get them interested and involved, I mean, certainly reach out to them, call them, ask to meet with them, um, point them to us, right? If you're meeting with a public defender office, say, why don't you call the Ohio Public Defender Office and ask them what they did and how they did it? Or if you're meeting with your ACLU, ask them to reach out to Ohio or Nevada or Michigan and say, you know, your colleagues in those states really took the lead on this issue. You know, would you mind talking to them? Um, sometimes, it, they're, sometimes it gives them a little more comfort to take on an issue they're not that familiar with if they know that their colleagues in other states have taken it on, and especially if they've taken it on successfully. This is going to be the last question. Unfortunately, there's tons of them we didn't get to ask. Maybe... I don't know if you'd be willing to answer per questions sure. personally. Yeah, I'll be around until about 2 or 3 this afternoon, so I'll be happy to meet with folks. So the last question is a bit, uh, again, more specific in scope. Uh, does the court where someone is sentenced has any role when the person no longer resides there? Um, that's going to vary, obviously, state by state. Um, in Ohio, 
it, it, it's just kind of one of the complexities of the law. You're obviously sentenced in one county court, and, and originally you were classified in that court. Um, but then under the new law, your classification depended on where you were living at the time. Um, and so when people were challenging their classifications in Ohio, they had to challenge them in the county in which they were currently living. Um, that's just how Ohio chose to do it. I suppose that in another state, they could choose to do it another way and make you possibly go back to your original county court um, to challenge any kind of reclassification. So that's something that I think would probably vary uh, state by state. Well, thank you. A good hand of applause thank for you. Amy. Thank you.